everyone uh, welcome to the daily current affairs of 6th january 2023 so these are the sources from the current affairs uh, which i have covered mostly the relevant sources which are important for prelims so uh, these are the contents which we will cover today so uh, the shrine sammit shikhar ji is in news uh, because of uh, the protest by jains because it was uh, designated as a eco tourism destination so there was a protest by the jain community and uh, after the protest the central government has halted all such activities uh, in the larger parshanath hill sanctuary so here we will cover the uh, parshanath hills led from the geography point of view we'll cover some important jain temples from art and culture point of view or art and architecture point of view we'll cover eco sensitive zones because it was the the area was declared as a eco sensitive zone now eco sensitive zone is also a prelim static topic which we'll cover from environment point of view all the details about eco sensitive zones then again uh, king cobras are in news in western ghats uh, like there is aadhar project now world's first vaccine for honey bees because of its disease fowl brood disease and antimicrobial resistance amr will discuss uh, what is amr what are the measures in india taken global measures recently youth 20 uh, summit was uh, done as a part of g20 csir labs uh, to turn into global center of innovation the union minister said it so we'll cover about csir now uh, big news is india deployed a women only platoon of peacekeepers to the un mission in abe there is a place uh, <coughs> border area of sudan and south sudan so we'll cover here uh, the role of indian women in peacekeeping forces and what are un peacekeeping forces and how uh, will Uh, in that point of time, we'll also cover the mapping of Sudan and South Sudan. Now, recently, uh, uh, there was a, not recent, by the way, sixth since sixth uh, January, there was a national conference on Chief Secretary. It was chaired by PM Modi Delhi. So, it is the second one. The first one uh, happened in twenty twenty two. Now, coming to an economy news, corporate tax collections has exceeded three percent of the GDP after a gap of two years. Now, what is corporate tax? Will cover. <clears throat> fine now coming to the first news uh, regarding the protest by jain community over designing the main shrine sammit shikhar ji that is in jharkhand as a eco tourism destination so the jain community uh, were deeply hurt by this because it's a religious sacred place and they were hurt by the decision of the government when government uh, designated it as a eco tourism destination so now the central government has halted all such activities in the larger parshanath hills sanctuary so recently the minister also said ki we met the jain community who have been urging to protect the sanctity of the sammed shikhar assured that uh, pm uh, modi ji's government is committed to preserving and protecting the rights of jain community all over religious sites now the state government is directed to immediately take all steps necessary to ensure the same fine so here so this is the shrine now these are the topics we have to cover parshanath hill important jain temples eco sensitive zone so it is it becomes the topic becomes a very multi dimensional because we are covering from geography point of view we are coming from history point of view art and culture we are also covering from environment point of view okay now coming to the parshanath hills so it is a mountain peak in the parshanath range in jharkhand towards the eastern of the chota nagpur plateau in the grey district of jharkhand now the hill is named as lord parshanath Uh, who is no, uh, called as the twenty third Tirthankar? Uh, the name is Parshanath because uh, he attained the Nirvana in this hill. Now this hill is the highest mountain peak in the state of Jharkhand. Now coming uh, uh, to the Jain heritage, like uh, what is the significance of this particular uh, site or uh, this particular uh, hills? Now it is one of the most holy and revered sites for the Jain community. Now Jains call it as Sammed Shikhar. Shikhar means hill, so they call it as Sammed Shikhar. It is a major pilgrimage site by both Digambaras and Shwetambaras. There are two main divisions in Jainism, which we cover in our static topic. <coughs> so it uh, caters to both, both of them. Out of the twenty-four Tirthankaras, twenty got Nirvana on the Parshvanath hills. In this particular hill, uh, hills twenty-four uh, uh, Tirthankars got Nirvana or enlightenment. On the mountain, there are The Shikhar Ji Jain Temple, so we call it as Sammet Shikhar Ji Jain Temple, is an important Tirtha Shetra or Jain pilgrimage sites. So it is also one of the important Jain pilgrimage sites. So what you can do is you can just check in net 
वट आर द अदर जैन पिलग्रिमेज साइट्स जस्ट रिमेंबर सम इम्पोर्टेंट नेम्स एंड इन विच स्टेट दे आर सिंपल नाउ दिस शिखरजी टेम्पल इज ऑल्सो नोन एज जेनिथ ऑफ कॉन्सेंट्रेशन यू कैन रिमेंबर दिस जेनिथ ऑफ कॉन्सेंट्रेशन फॉर वन लाइनर क्वेश्चन दे मे आस्क फॉर इज तीर्थंकर देर इज अन ऑन द हिल नाउ दिस पॉइंट इज इम्पोर्टेंट फॉर प्रिलिम्स पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू द जैना टेम्पल इज बिलीव टू बी कंस्ट्रक्टेड बाई मगधन किंग बिंबिसरा सो नाउ वी गो बैक टू वी कनेक्ट टू मगधन एम्पेयर ऑफ सिक्सटी सेंचुरी बी सी ड्यूरिंग महाजनपद सो द टॉपिक इज महाजनपद सो इट इज बिलीव टू हैव टू हैव कंस्ट्रक्टेड बाई बिंबिसरा बिकॉज बाई जैनिज्म एंड बुद्धिज्म गोज बैक टू सिक्सटी सेंचुरी बी सी the bore came in 6th century bc now kanigam told stone noted stone structures in the village which he describes as a remnant of a buddhist stupa uh, datable to or uh, going back to the 2nd century bc although the site was noted by kanigam no excavation held till date abhi tak koi excavation nahi hua hai so just you need to remember this point by magadhan king bimbisara so it goes back to so this particular shikhar goes back to Or the Jain temple goes back to sixth century BC. Okay, fine. Now coming to uh, some connected topic that is some important Jain temples will cover. Now the topic is art and architecture. Now first and foremost, the most important uh, which we already know is the Dilwara temple of Rajasthan. This is the Dilwara temple. Now some important factual data which will help you in prelims. Built by Vimal Shah. Now timeline is 11th century, 13th century AD, medieval. Okay, and the Dhokla Jain ministries at that point of time they designed it brilliantly. Dhokla Jain minister, uh, ministers were a particular kind of uh, sect of uh, Jains. The vast structure is divided into five sections, each of which is divided to one of the Tirthankaras. Now, Lord Adinath's temple is the oldest here. A lot of Tirthankaras temples are here inside this particular temple, and Lord Adinath's temple is the oldest. Now, one more important temple is Palitara temple. It's always in news, and uh, it has become a part of the static course now. When you cover Jainism, you have to cover this temple, Palitara temples. now this is palitara temple is very um, uh, and it's one of the most beautiful places sacred places now it is on the satrunjay hills you have to remember the name satrunjay hills near palitana gujarat to in gujarat satrunjay hills it is also built in 11th century so timeline is also important because you should know which hill what timeline under the reign of king kumar pala and took 900 years to complete So all these temples are a part of Solanki dynasty. Solanki dynasty, which we call as the architecture name is Maru Gurjara architecture. Very important for prelims. Maru Gurjara architecture, Solanki dynasty. Okay. So between the 14th and 15th centuries, Muslim invaders destroyed it. One of the most sacred of Swetambara tradition. So here it is mostly. caters to shwetambaras but only one digambara jains only have one temple here now this point is also unique because only out of the whole this palitana hills only digambar jains only have one temple for them now maru gujara architecture solanki dynasty it is dedicated to adinath jainism's first tirthankar okay so here you can go through the maru gujara architecture Uh, if you cover the book name, ancient book name, or ancient medieval, one book is there, Poonam Dalal Dahiya. It's a very good book. You can cover the Maru Gujar architecture, some temple names, because Maru Gujar architecture caters to Gujarat and Rajasthan. It is nothing but from the western chalukya solanki dynasty is also called as western chalukyas okay or we call it as sorry we call it as gujarat chalukyas uh, they have nothing to do with our south chalukyas they are different these are different okay fine 
ओके नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट इज रनकपुर जैन टेम्पल इन राजस्थान दिस इज रनकपुर जैन टेम्पल दिस इज अ श्वेतांबरा जैन टेम्पल बिल्ट इन फिफ्टींथ सेंचुरी एंड इज फेमस पिलग्रिमेज साइट जैन पिलग्रिमेज साइट एंड इज ऑफ एंड कंसिडर्ड एज एन आर्किटेक्चरल सिंबल अराउंड द वर्ल्ड द फोर फेस्ट चतुर्मुख टेम्पल डेडिकेटेड टू आदिनाथ द फर्स्ट जैन तीर्थंकर इज द मोस्ट सिग्निफिकेंट द एंटायर कंस्ट्रक्शन इज मेड अप ऑफ लाइट कलर्ड मार्बल विथ टेरेट्स एंड क्यूपोलाज राइजिंग मेजेस्टिकली फ्रॉम ऑफ दी ग्राउंड नाउ जस्ट यू नीड टू रिमेंबर द प्लेस रनकपुर जैन टेम्पल इज इन राजस्थान एंड द टाइम लाइन इज फिफ्टीन सेंचुरी ए डी मिडियवल नाउ गोमतेश्वरा टेम्पल ऑलवेज इन न्यूज एंड इट इज अ पार्ट ऑफ आर्टिक कोर्स ऑल्सो इट इज मैंशन इन बुक्स नाउ दिस इज गोमतेश्वरा टेम्पल द स्टैचू इज डेडिकेटेड टू जैन गॉड और जैन फिगर बाहुबली इट्स अ फिफ्टी सेवन फुट मोनोलिथिक स्टैचू ऑन विंध्यागिरी हिल इन द टाउन ऑफ शवन बेलागोला मोनोलिथिक फाइन मेडअप ऑफ मार्बल नाउ मोनोलिथिक मीन्स ओनली ऑन वन पर्टिक्युलर थिंग इट्स ओनली मेड अप ऑफ मार्बल नाउ टाइम लेन इज टेंथ सेंचुरी ए डी बाय द वेस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी वेस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी इज कर्नाटका साइड ईस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी इज उड़ीसा साइड ओके सो ईस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी इज ऑल्सो इम्पोर्टेंट फॉर एग्जाम ओके नाउ ईस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी द फेमस जगन्नाथ टेम्पल ऑफ पुरी ओके कोणार्क टेम्पल ऑल आर पार्ट ऑफ ईस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी ओके नाउ वेस्टर्न गंगा डायनेस्टी इज इन कर्नाटक एरिया बट इज कमिशन बाय गंगा डायनेस्टी गंगा डायनेस्टी मिनिस्टर एंड कमांडर द नेम इज चावंदराया now here one uh, every 12 years a famous festival happens which is known as maha mastaka abhishek pm modi also went there back in 2017 or 18 so it happens every 12 years now one thing uh, you need to remember is the vindhyagiri hill now it is it is it is situated in the vindhyagiri hills right now it is one of the two hills in savana velagora one is vindhyagiri hills the other is chandragiri which is also a seat of ancient jain centers much older than the gomteshwara statue now gomteshwara statue is in vindhyagiri there is another uh, hills called chandragiri it is also uh, like it also caters to lot of jain centers chandragiri is dedicated to the jain figure bharat here it is bahubali Here it is Bharat, and he is no, no, nothing but the brother of Bahubali and the son of first Tirthankar, Rishabnath. Okay, so these are some prelims uh, uh, booster points which also you need to remember and make notes out of it. Next is Kulpakji Temple, Telangana. Now, it is tenth century, famous Jain pilgrimage site. Now, under the auspices of Kakatiya dynasty. This movement holds a great deal of significance for the Swetambar Rajans. Now, Kulpakji was also in news. Why? Because in April 2022, during the renovation, now this temple renovation was happening. During renovation in Someshwara Temple, this is very near to Kulpakji. So when the reno renovation was happening of the Someshwara Temple, there a four by one point four feet, two four by one point four feet sculpture was discovered of Maha. Jaina, Pada means foot, okay. Of Jain Tirthankar was discovered, Maha Jaina Pada, okay. So you have to remember this because it is in news. Next coming to Hanum Hanumantal, Bada Jain Temple. It is in Madhya Pradesh. Now it is also in news. We'll come to know why it's in news. First of all, we should know situated at of Hanumantal, which was once one of the Jabalpur's most important centers. It's in Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. Established in sixteen eighty six. It is said to be the country's largest Jain temple with twenty-two shrines dedicated to various deities. So, largest Jain temple in the country. Now, only one image is there of Jain goddess Padmavati. That is still worshipped in Central India. Now, it's a news because this idol was found missing on sixteenth May twenty twenty-two night. Okay, fine. So we are done with the important Jain temples. Next is. 
one keyword which is uh, associated this news is eco sensitive zones now eco sensitive zones are those zones which are very fragile ecologically fragile okay so ecologically fragile areas now the areas the minister of envoy first of all who designates this that is central government now central government means who that is ministry of environment forest and climate change it designates eco sensitive areas or zones around in and around protected areas national parks wildlife sanctuaries okay <clears throat> the land within 10 kilometers of the boundaries of national parks and wildlife refuges will be designed now the land within 10 kilometers if this is a national park within 10 kilometers they can designate it as a ecological fragile area because they will act as a buffer for the conservation of that particular protected area now while the 10 km rule is applied as a general principle the extent to which it is applied can vary no the it is uh, the general rule is 10 km but uh, it can vary it can vary now i'll i'll explain you the legal thing about uh, this from where this 10 km came areas larger than 10 km in length may also be designated it does not mean ki it's only 10 km is a mandatory thing generally it is 10 km it can be greater than 10 km also but it will be done by union government because everything is done here by designated by central government if it contain largely ecologically larger ecologically significant sensitive corridors now now the question is these ecological sensitive areas comes under or uh, like it came from which act or they are noti notified or designated from, through which act they are notified by union government or invoked under the environment protection act of 1986 okay now the question is are they defined are these ecological sensitive zones defined now the question are they defined under ep act the answer is no they are not defined they are since like what exactly is ecological sensitive zone we know what is sensitive zone but they are not clearly defined in the law they are simply invoked now this 10 km thing came from a policy around 2002 or 2003 now this 10 km thing is also not mentioned in the ep act that is environment protection act of 1986 okay and it is done by notified by central government always remember not the state government by the central government that is ministry of environment forest and climate change now there was a question back in 2014 about ecologically sensitive zones now the question was ecological sensitive zones are the areas that are declared under wildlife protection act clearly it is a wrong statement because it is under environment protection act of 1986 now the thing is because it is these zones are in and around 10 km around protected areas national parks wildlife sanctuaries and all these things are defined under wildlife protection act because wildlife protection act defines like it gave a statutory backing to protected areas national parks and wildlife sanctuaries but eco sensitive zones are in and around national parks but they are not under wildlife protection act they are invoked under or declared under ep act under ep act of 1986 the purpose of the declaration of eco sensitive zones is to prohibit all kinds of human activities in those zones except agriculture no not only not all there are other things also which are not allowed or some things are allowed first of all this is also wrong statement because agriculture horticulture practices by local communities organic farming rainwater harvesting scientific research are all permitted because these are like these are progressive things these are good things so these are all permitted by the government or in the ecology eco sensitive zones <coughs> hence both statements are wrong now this is the uh, report which the government gave so the government gave this point so the state government gave in this regard the state government is directed to immediately take all necessary steps to strictly enforce the provisions of 7.6.1 of the management plan of the parashnath wildlife sanctuaries now here if you see 
categorically it is prohibited selling of liquor drugs and other intoxicants playing loud music or use loud speakers defiling sites of religious and cultural significance such as sacred monuments you can't defile there lakes rocks caves and shrines you cannot damage flora and fauna causing environmental pollution committing injurious acts to forest water bodies plants animals or disturbing the natural tranquility of such sites coming up with pet animals and unauthorized camping and trekking you can, like it is available but unauthorized camping and trekking also you can't do so this is what the government said so you have to remember this these are not allowed now you can for prelims okay now so the state government has to uh, do it because it is directed by the center it is directed by the minister of environment it is nothing but center of central government now the central government has also constituted a monitoring committee okay a monitoring committee now the state government is directed to have two members from the jain community and one member from the local tribal community as permanent invitees to this monitoring committee now sent now this monitoring committee it means it will monitor so it is by the central government so it is constituted by central government not state government now the state government uh, like the central government has set to the directed to state government in to have two members from jain community and one member from the local tribal community as permanent invite okay fine so uh, i guess this much is enough for uh, prelims point of view now coming to the next important part of environment so these all are uh, these all current affairs these are in news but these are actually not covered everywhere so there are some news you'll get in some other uh, news like some federal uh, channel is there even down to earth okay so these are small small information which the upsc usually ask which are not easily accessible not easily found in the market so remember one thing anything which is not easily found in the market is very important for prelims because if you see the cut off is less than 100 out of 200 so it is a very clear thing the exam questions are not easy are not that easy so a bit of content plus concept plus mcq practice is required to clear prelims okay now the news is aadhar project so there is a aadhar project of king cobras in the western ghats so here some researchers these are the research this is the researcher's name gumbe researcher they uh, they probe the secret and shy lives of king cobra king cobra uh, like they say ki they are very shy the reptile it's a fairly sedate life uh, staying put inside a home range of 8 to 10 km it stays out for just two reasons food and sex so we need to know what is this aadhar project of king cobras in western ghats plus about king cobras will cover here itself now this project is underway in western ghats to give an aadhar like unique identification number to king cobras one of the largest Uh, world's largest snakes and apex predator in the thick forest of the region now the, the staff at karnataka's agumbe rainforest research station they have tagged over 100 king cobras with a tiny chip the size of a basmati rice grain so they have tagged uh, a small chip into 100 cobras now the chip comes with a 15 digit unique number which pops up when the tagged snakes are scanned with a small device so they can monitor it's for monitoring the snakes the chip which is placed between the skin and muscle of the snake 
through a simple procedure is helping researchers find new ways to probe these still mysterious snakes so in a way that we are doing a research on these snakes because to to know about their lives now about king cobra it is endemic to tropical jungles in southern and southeast asia in obviously including india in india it is found everywhere in north western ghats it is found in uh, northeast okay unlike many snakes it rarely consumes mammalian vertebrates lizards birds and their eggs usually snakes consume all these things but king cobra does not it very rarely does so what it uh, consumes then king cobras prey chiefly on other snakes they prey on other snakes both venomous and non venomous including their own species they can prey on their own species also so this is a very unique point okay it is regarded as a national reptile of india the species has an eminent position in the mythology and folk traditions of india bangladesh sri lanka and myanmar it is very famous in the folk traditions of these four countries king cobra has been listed as vulnerable since 2010 in the iucn red list so this is a environment current affairs about king cobra now one more news uh regarding science so it is uh, the news from down to earth world's first vaccine for honey bees <clears throat> now the news is that world's first vaccine for honey bees gets conditional not in us now there is a there is a disease there is a disease that is american fowl brood or brood uh, anyway you can pronounce it is a bacterial disease which happens to honey bees remember so for them there is a vaccine world's first vaccine for honey bees now the disease what is this disease american fowl the disease cannot be cured meaning that the destruction of infected colonies and hives or eradication of infected material is the only way to manage the american fowl brood now the us department of agriculture has granted a conditional license for a vaccine for honey bees to curb this which is very fatal bacterial disease for the insect so it, this disease is for the insect it is caused by uh, a spore forming bacterium penicillus larva so just just you need to remember so the vaccine is for honey bees and you need to know the this disease which happens to honey bees that's it next topic the topic is related to g20 because india is taking the leadership so lot of news about g20 you will get to know this year uh but uh, g20 questions was already asked last year in 2022 prelims so and that to india is hosting so lot of news will come this year but as per my calculations you will get no question in prelims about g20 if you get it will be easy it will like you will not get very detailed question because in a way everyone will study g20 and go to the exam and uh, upsc is surprise commission the one you study more you will not get questions from there it's the past record of upsc fine so still then but we have to cover it's our duty to cover y20 that is youth 20 summit india so union minister sri anurag singh thakur to the launch the y20 summit okay now uh, the summit is mainly to focus on the global youth leadership in partnership okay now y20 is the official youth engagement group now see the thing is g20 has lot a uh, lot of engagement groups out of them one is youth 20 these are nothing but engagement groups for, uh, for parliaments for women space things startup urban so all these things civil societies so all these things you can just go through uh, nothing specific here so it is the world forum for the world's largest and most advanced economies g20 so g20 you have to cover uh, it is available in the net better to go to the g20.org and see for some frameworks name or anything which is important uh, it is a process which brings together young leaders from across the globe to discuss and debate all the global challenges okay now india is hosting for the first time y20 ui20 youth 20 summit india is hosting for the first time 
now uh, it started in like hosting this uh, y20 started in 2010 okay so it started in 2010 but this time india is focusing or um, hosting it for the first time fine next news is csir labs in india to turn into global centers of innovation so union minister jitendra singh said all 37 csir labs in india will turn into global centers of research and innovation so we need to know what is csir when it came uh, and uh, under which ministry it is who is the president all those things we need to know now csir is nothing but council of scientific and industrial research it is an autonomous body that has emerged as the largest research and development organization in india it is nothing but it does a research and development now it is an autonomous body but uh, it is not directly not under ministry of science and tech it is not but it is funded by ministry of science and tech it operates as an autonomous body through the society's registration act of 1860 now if somebody ask whether csir is a state under article 12 now article 12 defines what is a state now yes it is a state because it is funded and it is clarified by supreme court verdict there is verdict no need to know the name there was a verdict obviously csir versus uh, uh, like it is a csir case so it is a state okay president is prime minister of india now the original structure is president will be the anyone who is the prime minister will be the ex officio president vice president will be the minister so have to remember the vice president is the minister of science and tech now the governing body the dg that is the director general is the head of the governing body the other ex officio member is the finance secretary in particular the secretary of department of expenditures now in comment box please write what are the six departments of ministry of finance there were five departments what is the new one which was recently added as a department under ministry of finance fine the member terms are for 3 years csir advisory board 15 member body composed of prominent members from respective fields of science and technology its function is to provide essent inputs to the governing body member terms are for 3 years fine now the next topic is antibiotic resistance in waste water may trigger antimicrobial resistance in india china there is a study which is saying in waste water the antibiotic resistance it can trigger antimicrobial antibiotic is bacteria micro means bacteria virus fungi everything okay now this is the news fine so here the news is antimicrobial resistance now these are the findings as per the research the research says a new research has been pointed the role of waste water in contributing to antimicrobial resistance usually antimicrobial resistance happens because of irrational usage of antibiotics but here it is saying the waste water also is a reason and uh, in india and china which is the world's largest producer and consumers of antibiotics now the uh, antibiotic residues in waste water and waste water treatment plants here serve as the potential hotspots जो एंटीबायोटिक रेसिड्यूज रहता है वेस्ट वाटर में और जहाँ पे ट्रीटमेंट होता है वो ही सबसे पोटेंशियल हॉटस्पॉट्स है इट अकर्स व्हेन बैक्टीरिया बिकम रेजिस्टेंट जब बैक्टीरिया रेजिस्टेंस हो जाता है एंटीबायोटिक से काम ही नहीं करेगा तब द कॉन्सेप्ट इज एम आर और दीज आर कॉल सुपर बॉग्स सच सुपर बॉग्स आर ए ग्लोबल थ्रेट एज दे कैन लीड टू अनट्रीटेबल इन्फेक्शन इन एनिमल्स बिकॉज एक बार वो रेजिस्टेंस आ गया तो उसके बाद यू लाइक इट वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू गेट ट्रीटेड बिकॉज द antibiotic will not work because you are resistant to that antibiotic residues from water are likely to sweep into ground water it can pollute the environment during the production consumption and disposal of drugs now what are antibiotics these are drugs used to treat bacterial illness in both humans and animals they do this by either killing the germs or by making it difficult for them to develop and reproduce okay 
और ये रेजिस्टेंस वही है एक कंडीशन है जहाँ पे इन विच बैक्टीरिया वायरस फंगाई एंड पैरासिट्स इवॉल्व ओवर टाइम एंड द सीज द स्टॉप रिस्पॉन्डिंग टू एंटीबायोटिक्स मेकिंग इन्फेक्शन मोर डिफिकल्ट टू कीयर एंड रेजिंग द रिस्क ऑफ डिजीज ट्रांसमिशन लाइफ थ्रेटनिंग सिकनेस एंड डेथ दीज आर द रीजन्स इन पर्टिकुलर इट द इरेशनल यूज ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक्स विच कॉजेस फॉर क्योंकि हम क्या होता है हम कुछ भी अगर हो जाता है हम एंटीबायोटिक खा लेते हैं पेन कोई एक प्रकार का पेन हो रहा है एक एंटीबायोटिक खा लो वो कम हो जाएगा तो इरेशनल यूज ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक्स लीड्स टू एम आर फाइन नेक्स्ट नाउ दीज आर सम ऑफ द मेजर्स टेकन बाय इंडिया टू कॉम्बैट एंटी माइक्रोबियल रेजिस्टेंस वन इज द चेन्नई डिक्लेरेशन ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक्स इट्स इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व इट इज अ जॉइंट मीटिंग ऑफ द इंडियन सोसाइटी इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चेन्नई डिक्लेरेशन आज भी इंपॉर्टेंट है क्योंकि बहुत बड़ा डिक्लेरेशन हुआ था एट दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व इट वॉज अ फर्स्ट एवर मीटिंग ऑफ मेडिकल साइंस सोसाइटीज इन द कंट्री ऑन द एम आर इशू आई डिमांडेड इमीडिएट एक्शन to create a national policy to deal with this particular amr and that in 2017 happened a national amr action plan sarkar ne kiya tha with the goal of various uh, like involving various stakeholder departments the one health approach aur ek bhi scheme aayi thi by icmr that is indian council for medical research antibiotic stewardship program ye bhi ek hua tha okay next is some global measures तो अभी तक यू कैन सी देर इज नो क्लियर कट ये सब तो है बट देर इज नो क्लियर लॉ ओके सो वी नीड क्लैरिटी ए कंप्लीट पॉलिसी ए कंप्लीट पॉलिसी ऑन एंटी माइक्रोबल रेजिस्टेंस दैट ऑल्सो वेरी रिक्वायर्ड आवर वे फॉरवर्ड इन टू डेज टाइम ना कमिंग इन टू इंटरनेशनल मेजर ग्लोबल मेजर्स पे कुछ खास नहीं है इफ यू सी देर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड ग्लास देर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड ट्राइपार्टेड कोलाबोरेशन जहाँ पे यू एन यू एन ऑल्सो हैज़ डन समथिंग और एक ग्राम प्रोजेक्ट है ओके ग्लास स्टैंड फॉर ग्लोबल एंटी माइक्रोबियल रेजिस्टेंस एंड यूज सर्वेलेंस सिस्टम तो ये डब्ल्यू एच ओ ने लॉन्च किया था टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन में ओके और एक एफ ए ओ डब्ल्यू एच ओ एंड वर्ल्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑफ एनिमल हेल्थ ये सब मिल के दे लाइक इट वॉज ए कोर्डिनेटेड एफर्ट और ए कोर्डिनेटेड वन हेल्थ अप्रोच एंड कॉन्स्टिट्यूट द ट्राइपार्टाइड कोलाबोरेशन ए एम आर मिल के किए थे कि वी विल ट्राई टू वर्क ऑन दिस ओके बट आगे कुछ खास हुआ नहीं है नथिंग येट कॉन्क्रीट हैपन्ड एंड देर इज एन अदर ग्राम प्रोजेक्ट दिस ग्राम प्रोजेक्ट इज इट्स अ प्राइवेट थिंग इट्स इट्स अ फ्लैगशिप प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ ऑक्सफर्ड जी बी डी दे मे आज क्यों ग्राम प्रोजेक्ट कम्स अंडर यू एन सो इट विल बी अ रॉन्ग स्टेटमेंट ओके नाउ Uh, what what uh, like i feel is in a way forward if a question comes in mains what you can write is we need a united nation convention on the lines of unf triple c jaise climate change ke liye we have a convention we can have a convention on amr because it is a global health issue it's happening okay fine next news is uh now this news uh, came in january 6th india to deploy single largest platoon of women peacekeepers in a big jaga hai a b e y it's in a border of sudan and south sudan to jab country aati hai to immediately we need to do the border of that country so we'll cover the border of sudan and south sudan now india deploys a women only platoon of peacekeepers at the un mission in this place on the border of sudan and south sudan as a part of indian battalion in the united nations interim security force so here the news is indian peacekeeping uh, un peacekeeping forces so india kya kiya hai ek women platoon of peacekeepers diya hai wahan pe kahan pe border of sudan jaise hamara india aur pakistan तो जो बॉर्डर पे भी यूएन पीसकीपिंग फोर्सेस है तो यहाँ पे भी जब इशू उन दोनों कंट्री का हो रहा है सो इंडिया हैज डिप्लॉयड इट्स ओन प्लेटून वुमेन प्लेटून ऑफ पीस कीपर्स टू यूएन मिशन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर प्लेस कॉल बी ए बी ए बी वाई ई आई फाइन सो दिस इज इंडियाज लार्जेस्ट सिंगल यूनिट 
of women peacekeepers in a un mission since it deployed the first ever all women's contingent in liberia in 2007 mein kiya tha first ever women contingent us time pe it gave but this is the largest unit okay of women now the question comes in mains answer i think they can ask you women's role of india's contribution towards un peacekeeping mission women ka kitna role hai so this is the answer quite factual but uh, they may ask because it's a news now the viability now what is the women from india have a long history of participating in peacekeeping pehle to let us cover what is peacekeeping then we'll come back to here now peacekeeping force hai kya peace keeping force these un peacekeepers are known as blue helmets or blue berets okay so it consists of soldiers military officers police officers and also civilians so you need to remember this and that too from many countries do country ke beech mein jo problem hota hai unke border pe these are the forces which kind of a try to keep the stability okay this way that that's why they are called as peace keeping they can be from many countries not necessarily from this country and this country which are having issues they can be from any any country they ensure that the peace agreements or accords are implemented in war zones because war zones mein there are accords there are agreements which happens between two countries so these forces will ensure that the peace agreement are in, are implemented properly in addition they give help through confidence building measures electoral support improving law and order and bolstering social development that will bring positive economic changes okay so uh, it started in 1948 when the unsc authorized the deployment of un military observers in the middle east starting hua tha yahan pe now what is the process of formation like what what exactly goes through when like how it is uh, how the un peacekeeping force comes initially what happens when a peace treaty is signed or negotiated the parties involved might request the united nations to deploy a peacekeeping force to maintain order and ensure that the elements of the agreed upon peace treaty are implemented so the thing is when two countries are there a and b when there is a peace treaty between them any party any party can ask the united nations to deploy a peace keeping force okay now upon the approval of a mission by unsc obviously the unsc will approve it the department of peace keeping operations takes the necessary admin so there is a department who does uh, or who takes care of these operations so it will do the necessary arrangement so here approval is required now the leadership team is formed after which the department will ask assistance from members of the un in terms of force so ek bar leadership team form ho jata hai this particular department will seek assistance from members of the un there are lot of un member countries in presently there are around 190 plus countries nearly 195 now an ad hoc coalition is formed in this regard the size and strength of the force are decided upon the government in which by the government in which the territory in whose territory the peace keeping force will be deployed to it means what, what is the number of the peace keeping forces what will be the strength it will not be decided by un rather it will decided by the government in whose territory the peace keeping force will be deployed so these all are prelims point okay along with this the rules of engagement is formulated and agreed upon by the parties involved with approval from the unsc now unsc will give approval about the rules of the engagement once a force has been deployed a un special committee for peacekeeping operations oversees the general conduct and day to day operations once a force is deployed so there is a particular committee that is the un special committee on peacekeeping operations it will keep a eye on it or it will monitor the conduct now coming back to the women from india who have a long history in participating in peacekeeping forces the validity of women's peace and security efforts depends in large part on the contribution of women peacekeepers more women than ever before hold executive positions in un peacekeeping it's very important point women work with the united nations as citizens police officers and military personnel india was the first country to deploy the first ever all female formed 
पुलिस यूनिट इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ यूनाइटेड नेशंस ई स्कीपिंग इन लाइब्रेरिया इन टू थाउजेंड सेवन विच वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस इंडिया वॉज द फर्स्ट कंट्री टू डिप्लॉय द फर्स्ट एवर ऑल इंडिया ऑल फीमेल फॉर्म पुलिस यूनिट इट कंसिस्टेड ऑफ हंड्रेड थ्री वुमेन परफॉर्मिंग ऑपरेशनल टास्क प्रोवाइडिंग राउंड द क्लॉक सिक्योरिटी कैरिंग आउट नाइट टाइम पेट्रोल्स इन द कैपिटल एंड असिस्टिंग इन एनहेंसिंग द कैपेबिलिटीज ऑफ द लाइब्रेरियन पुलिस इट मोटिवेटेड अ जनरेशन ऑफ लाइब्रेरियन वुमेन to work in the nation's security field so it's a very big thing indian women have a long history in participating in even peacekeeping deployments before being sent to the republic of congo in 1960 women working in the indian armed forces medical services were interviewed by the un radio in the year 2014 indian cop shakti devi of jammu kashmir police who was deployed in the un assistance mission in afghanistan was awarded the international female police peacekeeper award by events police division for her exceptional achievements even dr kiran bedi was the events first police advisor so these women have made a significant mark in india's contribution towards the un mission of peacekeeping just make notes of it make small notes of it if required in exam you can mention it now coming to the uh, funding so un peacekeeping how is the funding done of the un peacekeeping forces now the mission is the peacekeeping mission is funded collectively by united nations member countries they collectively they collect it like the united nations member countries will do the funding the establishment and maintenance of its operations are decided by the unsc not unga not unga remember as per the un charter each member is legally bound to pay their individual share for peacekeeping each member is legally bound they have to pay their individual share for peacekeeping it is illegal as per un charter is nothing but it is the constitution now the un charter has come from a conference called yalta conference or yalta conference just to remember okay the expenses for a peacekeeping operation is divided by the unga based on the formula that takes into account the economic condition of member states as one of the factors now peacekeeping operation ka bhi kuch kharcha hota hai ya fir expenses hota hai it is divided by the divided among the countries all countries will have not have the same thing so it is done by the unga based on a formula like formula create karte hai depending the economic condition the condition jaisa hai country ka उस हिसाब से देर विल बी अ देर विल बी अ क्राइटेरिया और अ फॉर्मूला फाइन नाउ इफ यू सी दिस देर आर करेंटली ट्वेल्व पीस कॉपरिंग ऑपरेशन बाय द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ पीस ऑपरेशन सो दीज आर द पार्ट्स ओके पीस कीपिंग सो हियर इज द इज आवर इंडियन पाकिस्तान थिंग ओके यहाँ पे काफी होता है ऑल दिज अफ्रीका में हो रहा है ओके सो दीज आर द प्लेसेस ओके वेस्टर्न शाहरा सेंट्रल अफ्रीकन रिपब्लिक माली कॉन्गो गोलान साइप्रस लेबनन अब भाई अभी नाउ दिस इज व्हाट वी हैव डिस्कस दिस इज इन करंट अफेयर्स कोसोवो साउथ सूडान इंडियन पाकिस्तान दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट एंड मिडिल ईस्ट सो लेट अस कवर दिस यू एन एम ओ जी आई पी बिकॉज इट इज रिलेटेड टू यू नो पीस कीपिंग फोर्सेज बिटवीन इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान जो पी ओ के में जो अपना बॉर्डर इशू है वहाँ पर सो यू एन M O G I P that is United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan, nineteen forty nine established. Okay. Now observing the ceasefire in Jammu Kashmir, में बहुत ceasefire होते रहते हैं. So this is the this is the United Nations body which observes it. Okay. Now they arrived in nineteen forty nine to supervise the ceasefire between India and Pakistan. Okay. Now these observers, under the command of the military adviser appointed by the UN Secretary General, forms the nucleus of the PNGOIP. Fine. Now here, now what is the strength? The strength is around uh, like as on June twenty twenty two, it is hundred twelve. Like civilians are there, experts on mission. So just in, in remember, civilians are also allowed. Civilians can also take part. Okay. Now, which of the countries are contributing? contributing countries to this to the uh, observer group in india and pakistan so here if you see top 10 military contributors croatia korea thailand 
Philippines, Sweden, Argentina, Switzerland, Uruguay, Italy, Romania. So very uh, unconventional countries. So Croatia, remember, Croatia is the top military contributor to our uh, United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan. Okay. So now coming to the map, because we are covering about uh, Sudan and South Sudan. So this is the place uh, by area. This is the war zone or the sensitive zone. Okay. Why the news? News is here. So the deployment of women will be here. Indian women into the peacekeeping mission will be here. Fine. Now coming to the Sudan and South Sudan mapping. So this is Sudan. This is South Sudan. Okay. First of all, we'll cover Sudan's border countries. So Egypt is one. Libya is one. Chad is one. Central African Republic is one. I guess that's it. Okay, Eritrea is one. Ethiopia is one. Okay, Eritrea, Asmara is the capital. Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ababa is the capital. Okay, and it is also border with a sea called Red Sea. So Sudan has border with only one sea, that is Red Sea. But South Sudan is a landlocked country okay landlocked country so south sudan also has a first is it will have a border with sudan same border with ethiopia and uh, uganda kenya democratic republic of congo central african republic fine that's it so this is how you have to cover no river is border because it is landlocked fine coming to the next topic the second national conference of chief secretaries 2023 held by modi in delhi now the first conference happened in dharmashala in 2022 it's not like it's every year it will happen in delhi no first it happened in dharmashala so it is the conference of chief secretaries the chief secretaries are nothing but the it's the highest officer in the state government okay who will in a way advise to the cm will work with the cm so chief secretary is the top most executive official and senior most civil servant in the state government but it's an officer of the ias it means the officer will be under the payroll of the indian administrative service the chief secretary acts as an ex officio secretary to the state cabinet and the secretary to the cabinet you are the secretary to the cabinet or the advisor to the cm it also acts as the ex officio chairman of the state civil service board which recommends transfer postings of officers of all india services and state civil service in the state now who will uh, choose it will be chosen by the state chief minister so in 2015 previous year question this was asked Uh, about chief secretary so it will be chosen by the chief ministers with no fixed tenure tenure nahi hai now this is in state now what about union territories in this this is about union territories see obviously in union territories they are governed by administrators chief where which are governed by administrators chief secretaries will not be there because there is no cm there is no clear cut cm they are administrators right so they are absent but in these territories uh, an advisor to the administrator is appointed by the union government the advisor because somebody will advise right here the chief secretary is the advisor to cm but here the advisor to the administrator is not called chief secretary he will simply appointed his officer will be appointed by the union government now but with case of delhi jammu kashmir and puducherry where because their uh, legislative assembly is there so elections happen so which have been granted partial statehood they will have chief secretaries and there the chief minister will choose the chief secretary and is appointed by the lieutenant governor but will appointed by the lieutenant governor fine okay national conference so uh, the second national conference happened to promote cooperative federalism so that 
all states come together um, they will talk through the central ministries and work together between so uh, between the state and center state relation the effective coordination of policy all these things happens so they usually talk it's an important forum to exchange views on important policy related subjects and to strengthen team spirit to take india newer heights these are the themes which are discussed in the second conference not really required okay now some historical facts related to chief secretary now the office of a chief secretary had its origin during the british rule but the office of a chief secretary was origin in the central government it was in the central government during british rule now it is with the state government it was created in 1799 by lord wellesley you have to remember this so here we have to we are connecting with modern history okay lord wellesley who was the then general uh, governor general of india the first occupant of his this office was g h barlow in course of time this office disappeared from the central government and was adopted by the state governments much before the attainment of independence before independence only the position came towards the state government but uh, since 1973 uh, the things became very uh, like uh, in a very nationalized way or in a proper way a chief secretary is the senior most civil servant in all the states before that for instance he was considered junior to the financial commissioner in punjab and members of the board of the revenue in up in tamil nadu on the other hand it was he was the senior most civil servant so what i mean to say is before before 1973 it was not standardized but in 1973 this office became standardized on the recommendation of the arc administrative reforms commission and this post was equated with that of secretary to the government of india both in status and in amendments okay so coming to the uh, one economy topic about corporate tax now corporate tax collection exceeded 3% of the gdp after a gap of 21 22 after a gap of 2 years now what is a corporate tax now corporate tax is a direct tax placed on a company's net profit or income from its operation so after the net profit after the subtracting all those uh, things the net profit you get so it is a it is a tax on that particular thing so it can it is payable by both public companies and also private companies both which are registered under the companies act of 1956 in 1920 uh, the government had cut corporate tax rate uh, tax rate it has cut some which was, which was a good thing for the corporations uh, to uh, just to uh, increase the investments so uh, the thing is it it shows now because the government has cut so investments increased so the profits happened and the corporate tax collections have increased now this is the factual data which is not required this is the tax collection the gdp was this much so the net percentage of net corporate corporate tax to gdp has become 3.01% or nearly 3% now but there are some disadvantages the disadvantages of corporate tax is that double taxation excessive tax uh, filings are a problem it drives out foreign capital how double taxation depending on the type of corporation it may pay income taxes shareholders will pay taxes on dividends because uh, shareholders uh, uh, when they have a share in the company so when they uh, get that profit when the company earns some profit so they will get their share so dividend so there is a tax on that also so in a way it will be double taxation you are giving corporate tax you are giving this uh, income tax you are giving a tax on dividend so all these things are there so uh, just go through dividend distribution tax ddt so also economic topic i will cover it when the when it will be news okay there will be excessive tax filings are a problem uh, the many sorts of income and other taxes that must be paid so kafi extra tax filing ho jata hai it will drive out foreign capital which is one of the most important thing see corporate tax agar increase badh jata hai so foreign investments will go out from the country the it is very obvious when you increase the tax corporate tax so the investments will come which come from outside they will be not interested to invest in the country so the because usually the foreign investors would prefer nations with lower corporate tax for investments fine so uh, that's it so this is uh, Uh, just a small information this is the uh, mentorship program where uh, 
the usually the freshers or the working aspirants even the veterans who are into 2 to 3 years they face a lot of difficulty uh, because of uh, they they are not able to clear prelims the main thing is they are not able to clear prelims so here there is a thing called must visit delhi mindset which needs to be changed because preparation can be done from anywhere provided you have the right guidance this is the most important thing provided you have the right guidance so uh, so basically what uh, uh, here is done what i do exactly is all the static subjects including ethics the notes will be provided it covers both basic and advanced so the normal books you cover it is more of basic but this upsc needs some advanced preparation uh, like uh, some extra notes so here i have a compilation i have a compilation from advanced relevant books i am using the word relevant not using all books but very relevant books current affair miscellaneous compilation you will get some 2 years or 2.5 to 3 years there will be weekly schedules to cover the course every saturday there will be test series both prelims and mains monthly four essay you need to write and what you write you need to be one to one mains paper evaluation will be done online okay and personal doubt clarification all subject any subject you can ask any time apart from the time when i'm taking class so all these things are part of this mentorship program and any other uh, issues uh, if you are facing from upsc point of view you can uh, you can message me this is the number and this is the my telegram channel and uh, yeah that's it so we'll meet in the next class thank you